Today we're going to be taking a closer look at this new Variable ND filter from Polar Pro, as well as Variable ND filters in general, and find out if this Peter McKinnon edition is worthy of its price tag. Let's get undone. Gerald Undone. He's crazy. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and please ensure that your seat backs and tray tables are in their full upright and locked position. So first off, I need to tell you a little bit more about this video's thesis and provide a disclaimer. This video is sponsored by Polar Pro, which might typically suggest that there might be some bias to this video, but this video is not an ad or a paid review. Polar Pro knows what kind of videos I make, but they felt that there was a current lack of undone level comparison and testing on their new product on this platform. But the sponsored part comes in because they were so confident in their new filter that they gave me the money to buy any and all competing filters that I wanted to test against it. They obviously want me to like it and hopefully report to you guys that I like it, but the tests don't lie, so let's get into those results. Now there is not enough time in this video to provide a review of every variable ND filter out there because there is a surprisingly large amount of them I found while I was researching, but I will do my best to provide some must knows about the more popular ones that you're likely to encounter. Also, there are some mixed opinions out there on variable NDs, and many of them are justified. Variable NDs have inherent and mostly unavoidable limitations based on the design of the filter. These limitations come in because of the use of a circular polarizer. Variable NDs are just two polarizers working together, and in the first test, we're going to be talking about some of those polarization problems. So what you're looking at here is a blue sky shot on a 16 millimeter lens without a filter. I achieved this exposure by using shutter speed, which you typically shouldn't do for video, but I didn't want to affect the image by altering the f-stop or ISO at this time. If you notice, the blue has a gradient from white nearer to the horizon up to a darker blue at the top of the frame, and this is normal when you shoot 90 degrees rotated away from the sun without a filter on. Now let's put on a circular polarizer and see what happens. Do you see how much of that white that was close to the horizon has now been turned to blue, and that large tree and some of the shrubs are showing much stronger green colors? This is because a lot of the light that was reflected at a particularly bad angle was denied by the polarizer, allowing you to see through it in a way to a much more rich and smooth image. Now this is considered a positive and often sought after effect of polarizers, and can also be used with water and glass and other environments, but no neutral density has been applied yet. However, you can also start to see one of the issues with circular polarizers here as well. You see how there's this wide band of darker sky that runs from the top left corner to the bottom right corner, with lighter sky in the opposite corners? This happens when you shoot on wider lenses, and the wider you shoot, the stronger this effect can get. Here's an example of a 10mm shot from Dave Coleman at Have Camera Will Travel that shows just how intense this effect can be. Now when you buy an ND filter, you're not trying to create that polarizer effect or take on its known issues. Instead, you're just trying to darken your image. So now let's take a look at a solid, standard 3-stop ND which does not use polarizers and is not variable. You can see that this looks just like our original unfiltered image, except I was able to return the shutter speed three stops back toward its normal 180 degree position. We still have the typical white to blue fade, and the greens don't pop any more than they normally would. This is what we want from an ND, but to get that, you lose the flexibility of a variable ND. It's kind of like comparing a zoom lens to a prime lens. There's usually going to be some image quality concessions in order to gain that added versatility, unless you're willing to spend a lot more money to reduce those limitations. Well, the same is usually true when you budget for a variable ND. But let's put some variable NDs through the blue sky test and see how they perform. Okay, so first up here we have the Hoya, which is dialed into about two stops. And we can see right away that there is a serious reduction in both saturation and also adding quite a bit of that polarization effect that we were talking about. It's a bit of a hybrid between what we were expecting to see from the ND and also from the polarizer kind of mashed together. Overall, the image is okay, but it definitely did lose quite a bit of its punch. And if we up the intensity to four stops, not only do we have a lot more darkening, but we can see more of that diagonal pattern I was talking about, and we lose even more of the saturation just to get an overall kind of grayer image. Now, here we're going to cycle through the range on the Hoya so that you can see how the darkening takes place, that dreaded X pattern, and give you an idea of some of the issues when you turn two polarizers together. Next up we have the Tiffin, which does a lot better in terms of maintaining the saturation over the Hoya, but I feel like it has an even stronger version of that polarizing effect. The green is really popping out of the tree and those shrubs, and the blue is reaching further down toward the horizon. Here I'm just pulling up higher toward the sun to get sort of a worse angle so we can see how badly the darkening intensifies and uh, what kind of expectations we have for full performance at three stops with the Tiffin. Overall, the Tiffin's okay. I feel like it performed better than the Hoya, but again, still some unwanted effects definitely due to polarization. 
Now we'll cycle through the Tiffin so we can see what the unlimited range effects have on it. There's definitely some strange orbs that occur and then an intense bluing that takes place when you get toward the end there of these like larger blue discs that kind of come in and ruin any shot when you're at the max range. Now let's take a look at the Polar Pro version which is so much better comparatively. I would say that this is almost convincingly uh, what you would expect to see with no filter or with a solid variable ND. We get that white to blue gradient. There's not a lot of dark spots, maybe a little bit on the side, but it is very well controlled. And if we point up toward the sun here, we can see that the sky is very even and consistent all the way through with no significant dark blue angular patterns or circles showing up. This is tremendous performance from a variable ND and one of the best I've ever seen. I go through the range here on the 2 to 5 Polar Pro, although there's not a lot of point because there's hard stops, so you can't actually exceed the designated range, so you're never going to see that X pattern. The same is true for the B&W, which we're testing here, and I find the B&W also did really well to control any polarization effects, and looked very similar again to the no filter or a solid ND filter look. It might be a little bit of sort of a richer blue overall, which could be due to a little bit of polarization, and I might see a bit of a stronger angle, but collectively I would say this one and the Polar Pro did really well to maintain the original look. Here I'm just testing the 6 to 9 Polar Pro against the 2 to 5 to see if it's any different. I would say that there seems to be a little bit more of a polarization effect, which I can understand given that the density is a lot higher, but I'm quite impressed at how well this one handles the 8 stop range. I would say that we're getting similar performance compared to the B&W in its normal range, and significantly better than what we saw from Tiffin and Hoya, even when pointed at a bad angle up toward the sun. Now another thing you need to be aware of when you use a polarizer is your angle from the sun. Usually you want to put your sun at either 90 degrees to your right or your left and then shoot in this direction, or I guess behind you, and that'll give you a better region of the sky when it comes to saturation and reducing some of those polarization effects. However, a sign of a good filter is how well it handles those bad sun angles, which is likely to happen if you're just running and gunning and trying to find a nice composition regardless of what direction the sun is in. For example, here's the Polar Pro filter at a bad angle, panning back to our previous angle. Notice the large orbs of dark blue and light blue, but you'll notice that it does fairly well to keep its saturation. Now let's compare that to the KNF filter, which is otherwise a pretty great offering, but it's definitely a discount filter. You'll notice that a lot of the saturation is gone, and the sky seems like it has a weird vignette pattern in it. It's not actually a vignette, it's a polarization problem, which the Polar Pro handles much better than a lot of the competition, by the way, except for maybe the B and W filter, which also handles this quite well. Out of all the filters that I tested, only the Polar Pro and B and W filters were visually similar to the no filter and solid ND results. But let's move on to that vignette test now, since this is a sore spot for a lot of people. Now there's one thing you need to know. You can't escape vignetting completely when you use a filter that screws onto your lens. But there are a couple things you can do to reduce it. First off, you gotta know the limitations. If you wanna do panoramas with a 10 millimeter focal length, screw on filters probably aren't the right answer for you. Most filters achieve their best corners around the 35 millimeter focal length and beyond, but there are some high quality ones that can go much lower than that. Generally, the more you pay, the wider the lens you can use. In our sky tests at 16 millimeters, the Polar Pro and the B&W did quite well. It even says on the Polar Pro website that there's no vignetting down to 16 millimeters. I think there might be some vignetting, but it's definitely usable even at 16 millimeters. Now there's two other issues that arise when you use filters, more predominantly circular polarizers, and that's darkened areas usually in the form of diagonal lines or circular patterns, as well as a color cast. I took several sequences of photos of the same white sheet of poster board to check for color cast and darkening. This also allowed me to check how the gauges work for each ND to see if the filters were meeting their advertised stops and how well the stops were being represented by the markings on the filters. First up, we have a simple image of no filter to give us a control. The white balance was custom set and didn't change throughout the entire shoot. Now the first filter we have here is the Tiffin Variable ND for $119. Oh, by the way, all of these prices are based on the 82mm version of the filter, except for the Zome Eye, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which I could only get at 77mm. I always recommend getting the 82mm version of a filter and then just using step-up rings to adapt your other lenses. This will give you much better value in the long run. Plus it helps combat some of the effects we were just talking about, like vignetting and some of the weird polarization effects, because when you use smaller lenses you're just using the better center portion of that filter. Anyway, with the Tiffin, it starts out warm and gets cooler as we move through the range, until eventually adding so much blue that the image becomes completely unusable. Despite the Tiffin advertising a larger range than some of the others on this list, I found only about three and two thirds stops were usable. And the gauge is mostly useless and back weighted, and what I mean by that is that the first few dots only reduce by about a third of a stop, but then the last two dots reduce by four stops combined. 
So if it was very bright, you'd have to try and dial in your exposure between just two tiny dots and hope not to go over or you're gonna get that ugly blue disc thing. And unfortunately, this type of gauge is standard among pretty much all of the models I tested and saw online, except for three of them, the Polar Pro, the B&W, and the KNF, all three of which have hard stops, so you can't really go past and enter into that bad territory. But only the Polar Pro has clear markings with an arrow that have numbered stops rather than weird dot systems. Next up, let's look at the Hoya, which actually has the worst gauge of them all. It still has all the other problems as every other one, but the markings are actually in reverse. On all the other filters, it goes from minimum to maximum. Minimum being the least amount of reduction and the brightest image, and maximum being the most amount of reduction, the most ND, and the darkest image. On the Hoya, it's reversed. Maximum is the brightest image and the least amount of reduction, and minimum is the darkest image and the most amount of reduction. To my brain, this doesn't make any sense, and I still find it confusing using the Hoya, even though I've actually used the Hoya for quite a while now, I still get it backwards half the time. The Hoya comes in very close to the Tiffin at $129, and also has a warm cast, but holds out a little better before the dreaded X pattern ruins the shot. I'd say you can probably squeeze out four usable stops on the Hoya, but then it falls off very quickly. Now both the Hoya and the Tiffin have kind of discounted alternative versions to their filters in a sense. The companies aren't related, but if you look at the design, it kind of seems like a cheaper version of the Hoya and the Tiffin. These options are the Gobi and the Zomai, and they're much cheaper. The Zomai is like $28 and the Gobi is like $54, despite them working surprisingly similarly to the Hoya and the Tiffin. Now there are two things to keep in mind when it comes to discount filters though. One, they usually have worse flare, which we'll get into in a minute, and two, you can expect to have worse packaging and quality control. The Gobi, for instance, has many reviews online reporting that it came in dirty, slightly scratched, and rough metal in some places, and the Zomai has reports of lowered sharpness and severe discolored ghosting. But in my testing, to be honest, they're not that much worse than the Hoya or the Tiffin, so you can definitely save some significant money as long as you're willing to accept those potential drawbacks. I've been finding lately that when it comes to filters, there's only two tiers to buy, low tier and high tier, because the mid tier is just filled with low tier products at mid tier prices with only moderate improvements. So let's move on to some high tier filters, starting with the Sing Ray, which costs $420. The Sing Ray scored the best in terms of usable stops at 5 and 1 3rd, but it still has the same finicky dial and also produces a color cast, which just goes to show that casts are pretty much unavoidable when it comes to variable NDs, and again, that's because of the polarizer. I took two shots at the end, one of just a solid 3-stop ND and one of a circular polarizer, and you can see that the ND managed to keep the color integrity, but the polarizer caused the shift. So don't go spending $500 thinking that you're going to be able to avoid color casts, because you won't. Second best for usable stops was the B&W for $299 at four and two third stops. And this one wasn't so much because of issues of overturning or anything like the other filters because the B&W has hard stops. It's more just when you're at your last selectable position, the measured reduction of light was 4.66 stops. So that's its score. The Polar Pro at $249 came in very close to this result with four and one third stops at its darkest setting, but I prefer the markings on the Polar Pro because it clearly says five and then the arrow stops at exactly there and it won't turn any further. And I find this to be easier to understand, obviously, than the B&W, despite having pretty similar quality, but the B&W uses a strange sequence of dots, which I find doesn't make as much sense. The Polar Pro also managed the color cast quite well, better than the Tiffin and Hoya, but maybe not quite as good as the Sing Ray, probably on par with the B&W, and that's saying something considering that those are three and $400 filters. Now there is another discount filter I should mention, which is the KNF, which would be the cheaper cousin to the B&W filter. Like the B&W and the Polar Pro, it also has hard stops and performed quite well in the usable stop test with a quality range up to about four stops usable, but at the reduced price of only $64. But as we saw in the blue sky test, there are still some issues with the KNF, most notably the green and gray cast and reduced saturation that happened as we panned away from the sun. And like other cheap filters, there's also increased flaring and reduced sharpness. But if I was gonna buy one of the discounted filters, it would be the KNF, mostly because of the usability and the number of clean stops. Now usability is something that I wanna speak more about in the value section, but for now, let's do a quick run of flare and sharpness tests. I'm happy to report that when it comes to sharpness, most filters perform pretty much the same. There was a noticeable improvement in the Hoya over the Tiffin, which I found kind of surprising, and then a minor improvement with the Polar Pro and B&W over the rest. It was subtle and probably shouldn't impact a buying decision, but was noticeable. Then of course the discount filters all fared a little bit worse, but again, only by a minor amount. If I had to rank them for sharpness though, it would go like this. B&W and Polar Pro would tie for number one, then Hoya, then Sing Ray, then Tiffin, then KNF, then Zomai, and then Gobi. 
Lastly, when it comes to flaring and ghosting, the results were a lot more clear. Some filters reduced the flare by a lot, others didn't. The Polar Pro 2 to 5 stop and the B&W produced results very similar to not having a filter on at all, and this is due to their coatings and slim design. And I specified the Polar Pro 2 to 5 here because this is one test where the 6 to 9 filter was worse. And pretty much every other test that I mentioned, I would say the results were almost identical between the 6 to 9 and the 2 to 5, but not when it came to flaring. Now I expected this a little bit, I guess, because of the increased reduction of the 6 to 9 over the 2 to 5, and also the fact that it actually reflects gold color from the filter where the 2 to 5 stays black. And while it is a bit of a con, it should also be noted that none of the other filters are even able to create a usable image at six stops, even the ones that are rated to go up to eight and nine stops, where the six to nine Polar Pro can create a very good image at even eight stops of reduction. So basically, just if you don't want flare in your shots, watch the angles that bright lights are coming into the lens. During the test, I could have easily reduced the flare on all of these lenses by just flagging it off a little bit with my hand, but it does exist and needed to be mentioned. The Gobi probably performed the worst here with a brighter purple orb, and the other discount filters produced more unwanted effects than the Tiffin and Hoya, but the Tiffin and Hoya were still noticeable, where the B&W and Polar Pro 2 to 5 were nearly invisible. Now I did one other test with regard to the color cast to show that it isn't that big of a deal. Rather than set a fixed white balance and then just keep that the same and show how each filter is changing the color, I instead use the custom white balance tool on the camera and set a custom white balance every time I put a filter on. And as I've explained in previous videos, this is what you should be doing anyway. White balance is crucial and you don't actually set your white balance until after your lights and filters and the whole scene is set up. And so when I did that, you can clearly see that the filters color cast was completely removed by setting your white balance afterwards and probably shouldn't affect your buying decision that much. And now that we've normalized the images in this way, we can see each filter's darkening pattern when set to the same intensity of three stops, whether that be dark circles or diagonal lines. And again, for this one, I would say the B&W and Polar Pro did the best to create the most even image. All right, now let's see if we can throw all this information together and make some value assessments. I would say the best filter I tested was the B&W XS Pro with the Polar Pro being a close second. The Singray was probably third, but at 60% more money, it doesn't really make sense to spend that much for third place, considering that you can get the 6 to 9 and 2 to 5 combo from Polar Pro for only $20 more. The Tiffin and Hoya might seem like a nice balance between budget and performance, but I don't actually think that they're better enough to spend two or three times more over the discount filters. And when it comes to those discount filters, I would probably skip the Gobi because it costs like two times more than the Zomai with no real benefits. It's hard to ignore the Zomai at $28, but I would say of the discount lot, the KNF is probably the best value of the bunch. So if you're strapped for cash or just don't have really expensive cameras and lenses worthy of an expensive filter, I would probably go with the KNF. But if image quality is number one, there's only really two options, and that's the B&W and the Polar Pro, but there is a usability and price difference between them. I dropped the B&W filter two times while trying to screw it on, and on the second time, I took a little bit of a chunk out of the thread, which was quite frustrating. The Tiffin filter is actually the worst for this. I think it dropped that thing like five times because it's so big and clunky and smooth, and when you try to thread these things on horizontally while your camera is on a tripod, it can be quite tricky, and if they slip out of your hands and fall, could potentially break your 120, 130, or 300 dollar filter. But that's one thing, usability wise, where the Polar Pro just wins. In my opinion, this lens defender from Polar Pro, this rubber thing that goes on the end of your filter, is the perfect solution. Not only does it provide a lens cap, which you often don't have when you put a filter on, a lot of these don't really allow for any sort of lens capping solutions, so you're gonna have your expensive filter and it's gonna get damaged or scratched potentially. So I think they should definitely have a lens cap, and this one's included, but it also provides a tool for putting the filter on. It's rubber, it's easy to grip, you're less likely to drop it, and you can thread it on quite easily and nicely. And this is only a, like a personal experience thing but I threaded and de-threaded filters like hundreds and hundreds of times for this video and this is the only one that instilled confidence every single time. But if you do happen to drop it, your filter is in a protective rubber case. I would say it would spend up to $40 more for a filter package to have this lens defender included in it. But in the case of the Polar Pro over the BMW, you don't have to spend any more because the Polar Pro is actually $50 cheaper. And because these two filters are so close in quality anyway, the Polar Pro and the BMW, I would have naturally just recommended to purchase whichever one was cheaper at the time. But considering you get the lens defender and a better carrying case, you get both this hard case and a soft carrying pouch with the Polar Pro, where with the BMW you just get this lousy jewel case, I would say that the Polar Pro definitely wins in the value department. And if you're into Peter McKinnon, you're gonna get a bunch of signature stuff that'll probably add value for you if you're a fan. But for me, I would have thought there was value in it just if they shipped it like this. 
Now, no variable ND filter video would be complete without mentioning the value conundrum of the solid or fixed ND alternatives. You always get the response, yeah, but solid NDs are cheaper and better. And they're right, they are, definitely. You almost always get better quality and often at much lower price points. But who cares? It's like telling somebody who needs a 70 to 200 millimeter lens, yeah, but the 100 millimeter macro is sharper. Clearly, they need the versatility for a reason. But for the sake of being thorough, if you're someone who will only consistently need the same reduction of light, like say three stops, then you might as well buy a solid ND at three stops, save a bunch of money, significantly reduce color cast, and prevent any of the unwanted effects related to polarization. But if you need the versatility, then I would definitely get the Polar Pro. It comes in at a close second for the best quality variable ND I've ever tested, but at a better value, due to its lower price, significantly better ease of use and smarter design, and a complete set of protective accessories. In my opinion, it's the best option available on the market today. But that's going to be it for me. I hope you found this video helpful or at least entertaining. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, feel free to hit the dislike button twice. All right. I'm done.